My name is Andy Hogue. I'm on the faculty here at Baylor and am pleased to welcome Christopher C. Miller, who is professor of architecture at Judson University near Chicago, teaching the theory, history, and design of civic architecture and a seminar on modern problems of objects, architecture, and conviviality. His graduate studios take on uh, regenerative urban projects investigating contemporary challenges of inclusive housing, large buildings in historic settings, of sustainability, and in the common local desire for continuity in architecture and context. In 2014, he was co-author uh, for the endowment uh, brief on beauty and the thriving cities project at the Institute for Advanced Studies, University of Virginia. He's a member of an interna international group of academics, sustainability advocates, and urban missions leaders mobilizing for recognition by UN Habitat 3 to build awareness in the world's churches for the importance of the built environment and to promote a moral dimension of the cities we build. Just published is Shaping the World's Neighborhoods for Urban Shalom and Urban Shalom in the Cities We Need and also Coding for the Community putting tradition, from putting tradition into practice, heritage, place, and design. Proceedings of the fifth INTBAU International Annual Event of 2017. Underway is a review of Murray Ray's architecture and theology. On the drawing board, graduate students are proposing an inclusive revitalizing intervention for the Winston Green neighborhood in the Birmingham, UK metro area. Please join me in welcoming Christopher C. Miller. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. <clears throat> I'm grateful to uh, Darren Davis and to the Institute, um, and thank you all for your interest this morning. We will look at a dozen or so slides uh, as I make comments on the first question of stewarding our material resources in the environments we build. We'll follow that with, uh, with some questions. Uh, then at 11, Andy, if you can help me, I will show another dozen, uh, or start at 11 to uh, talk about uh, social sustainability, and then pause a second time and then I'll stop, uh, start a last session no later than 11.30 talking about theological implications and we'll of course finish at noon. So rising energy scarcity, climate change and health are converging in demands for compact, vibrant cities. Well-planned, walkable communities have all these characteristics, adequate levels of density, a diversity of land uses, well-designed streetscapes and buildings, Clear, des clear destinations for the pedestrian and proximity to transit. In urban design literature from 1985 to the present, there emerges a list of qualities constituting good places. Accordingly, industrialized nations are, re are now rediscovering qualities of highly performing cities. <clears throat> but there is uh, 200 years of global momentum fueled by competing globally uh, scaled economies. Our occupation of the earth is increasingly unsustainable. The world regenerates in 18 months what it takes, 20, uh, takes, takes us 12 months to consume. Uh, this rate is due to increase uh, to 24 months by 2030. Climate scientists have now rung the alarm on a worldwide emergency, reducing by half the tolerable uh, climate temperature rise and predicting a 10-year window in which global uh, killing calamity may yet be averted. Of greenhouse gas emissions, a third results from the construction, operation, and maintenance of urban buildings. A second and growing third results from the transportation of people and stuff. In only 14% of America's neighborhoods can residents walk to their daily and weekly errands. Doug Farr in the recent Sustainable Nation lays out a multi-year path for communities in the absence of national leadership to advance sustainability. He recommends a visit to a pilgrimage city like Charleston, South Carolina. For that reason, I will demonstrate when I can evidence from Charleston. The top image here shows energy consumption at the scale of a city in studies of London, Toulouse, and Berlin. Blue represents no energy use, no active energy use. Yellow in slender buildings signifies the lower energy demand in buildings that are passively heated, cooled, and ventilated. Red in the buildings having broader footprints 
signifies the high energy consumption of active heating, cooling, and ventilating. At center is Charleston uh, in a plan detail showing building footprints from 1888. This map is shown at a scale similar to, the, to that of the city studies above, indicated as a city of building footprints shaped efficiently to passive heating, cooling, and ventilating. And at bottom, a study of one neighborhood in Charleston, the Radcliffe Borough, that shows porches in yellow that are placed to shade south and west faces of buildings. At left uh, is a bird's eye view of St. James Church Piccadilly in London, opened 1684. Nearer left is a detail from Stripes Survey of London, 1720, showing, uh, showing St. James standing free with, an with access to sun and light. Hawks in Architecture and Climate points to Wren's rec recommendations for the building of 50 churches in post-fire London. Hawks observed, or observes that St. James Piccadilly performs to one of Wren's recommendations that parishioners be able to see the liturgy. Because this church stands free on three sides and has its long axis in the east to west direction, the church's building, the church building's windows access the winter sun and the ambient light so much needed in London's at latitude. As a church has a, lar has, has a large interior volume serving so many people during the day and is so difficult to actively heat, so these south-facing windows are given urban priority to facilitate this passive heating. Largest uh, to right is a satellite map of the oldest, the originally walled city portion of Charleston in which boxed in red are four churches that benefit in their freestanding position from passive heating, cooling, and ventilating. In the days after the Great Fire of London, the King appointed a committee to make recommendations for the rebuilding. The committee recommended broadening important streets and establishing a range of streets with widths from 16 to 100 feet. At the top from left to right, first is a diagram illustrating the sort of two-story shallow floor plate row house houses permitted on a narrow street. Center shows the street facade of these two bay wide party wall row houses. I hope you follow my, my terminology here. And I'll define here a, sh a shallow floor plate is a floor that can be sunlit from windows. In a row house, the street side windows in a building with a 12 foot ceiling can use sunlight to heat the room uh, to, to a room that's 24 feet deep. That's what I mean by that. And at right is Woburn uh, Walk, uh, Bloomsbury in London by Thomas Cubitt, 1822. This view suggests the relation of two-story buildings framing a narrow street. At the bottom left and right, the diagram illustrates the four-story and habitable garret uh, shallow floor plate row house permitted on the wide street. And the far right is a photo of, this, of a typical West London street flanked by these four-story, three bay wide, party wall row houses. And finally, at center right, see a detail of post-fire central London with its various classes of street widths. The intention to broaden only selected streets has several positive outcomes. All, build, all streets built wide levy first time and maintenance costs against the city that could only have been offset by these wide streets being fronted by tall and therefore expensive buildings. With foresight, this is seen, was seen as establishing the potential for overcrowding. The consequence of classifying London streets by width and stipulating building height by street width meant that there would be houses for families of modest means with the assurance of access to winter sun, light, and air. Additionally, all income groups, not just the privileged, have access to the amenities and resources of central London. At left, a bird's eye a, a photo of Charleston encompassing at bottom uh, Broad Street, at left East Bay, at right Church Street, this view takes in one quarter of the original walled Charleston. Buildings in relation to street width are taller where they front wider streets, while buildings on the interior of the block facing narrower streets are shorter. We need to talk about density. A bad word in planning commission meetings, and I'll refer to the slide here because there's so many numbers. But I want you to see here is the progress of one city in, in the UK, Manchester, one neighborhood called Home. 
that in 1951 was occupied by buildings at a density uh, of 60 dwelling units per acre. Uh, that's important to know because at 50 dwelling units per acre, uh, you can support walkable community and transit use. 80 dwelling units per acre, that's about 10,000 people within a pedestrian uh, shed, support a neighborhood commercial area with a traditional offering of goods and services. And this works especially in cities that have high rates of automobile ownership. There are jobs and opportunities for businesses. And at Wright, a good example of this is West Greenwich Village, 125 dwelling units per acre. But look at what happened in Holm in 1991. This historic neighborhood was raised in favor of social housing and reduced in its density to 14 dwelling units per acre. At 15 dwelling units per acre, you can just support frequent bus service. And at, and at this rate, 16 dwelling units per acre, you can support at the intersection of four blocks, just the basic retail, maybe a coffee shop, maybe a dry cleaning. Seven to eight dwelling units per acre can support minimal bus service. And you can see again uh, on the right now, an example of uh, one neighborhood in Charleston that is seven to eight dwelling units per acre. And then finally, look at what's happened in home in the year 2000, where it was understood that they had decreased the density to an unsustainable degree, and they've, been, they've rebuilt to the density of 35 dwelling units per acre. Note that when you build, when we build at 30 dwelling units per acre, we lessen the infrastructure costs one to nine over highly sprawled suburbia. And at right, I draw your attention to the French Quarter, New Orleans, uh, 39 dwelling units per acre. I'm putting these, these nice examples at the right because for most of us, when we talk about density, we only see negative things. And I want you to see that density is how you describe some of the places we all want to visit. Again, Charleston. The original walled city of Charleston at present is occupied at a gross density of about 12 dwelling units per acre. There are 700, in this, inside this box, there are 720 residences of all sorts, houses, row houses, stacked condo apartments, duplexes and triplexes, apartment buildings, carriage houses, and other accessory dwellings. Unlike a typical American subdivision, there's also about 700, 790,000 square feet of commercial space food stores, three inns, five banks, 11 restaurants, 26 art galleries, and various other uh, small businesses, and civic and institutional buildings, a city hall, six museums, five churches, six cemeteries, two arts theaters, and a 450 student school. Not like any suburb I've seen. The United Nations 2008 publication, Kick the Habit, a United Nations Guide to Carbon Neutrality, published the graphic analysis at right of urban density and transit-related energy consumption, demonstrating that auto destination urban centers like Houston, the worst case, and Detroit consume about six and seven times the amount of energy per year in transportation for one quarter the population as a city like Paris. The vertical line marks Charleston's density and suggests an energy use consumption similar to that of Copenhagen. Notice too that the blue cities, while they uh, use remarkably little transportation energy, are the cities we want to visit and that we see as beautiful. At left, carbon emissions are lower in moderate and high density cities with a low emissions plateau for European and Asian cities. The horizontal orange line marks Charleston's population density and perhaps associated emo emissions level, again, similar to that of Copenhagen. Workplaces, shops, and residences, even energy efficient ones in remote auto-dependent locations generate vastly more transportation related emissions than locations in urban places where transit use, walking, bicycling are viable options. While few Americans would choose the density of Hong Kong, American cities, because of arrangements necessitating dependence on automobiles, are contributing disproportionately to the challenge of stewarding, stewarding resources. A compact city, 
like the highly livable Copenhagen, may need to be the goal of every American community. Now don't glaze over one more quite abstract diagram. At bottom right, or here, at bottom, at, at, at left, at top left, see activity and intensity. Um, excuse me, let me start over here. At bottom left, see activity and intensity versus passenger car use in 58 higher income cities, uh, this study from 1995. The orange bar marks the, the minimum threshold. The activity interest increases and passenger car use declines everywhere to the right. And this is the important thing. Activity and intensity is the combination of residents and jobs. At bottom left, excuse me, at top left, pedestrian sheds for different scale centers is from the same study by Newman and Kenworthy, urban design to reduce automobile dependence. The authors theorized two urban forms, the local center and the town center, whose sizes can reduce automobile dependence. The smaller the local center is a 0.6 mile radius circ circumscribing 740 acres that is, a transit or that is transit oriented and has adequate amenities and resources for those within walking distance. At the top, see this local center pedestrian shed circle laid over peninsular Charleston. This is evidence that counters a particularly American perception that our economy flourishes because of our access to automobiles. Instead, if we make compact urban designs, there can be less dependence on cars and there will be greater flourishing. By not living compactly, we, are we dampening the potential for jobs for our neighbors? Now we can consider one of the standard urban metrics uh, called permeability. Permeability simply describes block length and health outcomes are correlated. At bottom left, see Frumkin, Frank, and Jackson's Urban Sprawl in Public Health 2004, arguing that sprawl with automobile dependency that prevents healthful walking and vehicle-related deaths has to be reckoned a public health challenge. In fact, the extraordinary conclusion is that it's more dangerous now to live in the suburbs than it is to live in the city, uh, the city centers for those two reasons, obesity and traffic-related deaths. At top left, distance from the urban development boundary for Miami-Dade County. The color gradient correlates that the walkability of sprawl nearer to the boundary leads to poor health outcomes, while the greenest gradient yields better health outcomes because the block permeability is conducive to walking. And at top right is a Charleston map, 1739. Overlaid are 660 foot diameter circles. Some of you might know that's what's called a furlong, how far an oxen will drag a plow before he wants to turn around. Or maybe it's the farmer that wants to turn around. <laughs> the furlong has been found to measure, uh, well, uh, backing up, pre-industrial cities afforded this kind of permeability. And the furlong has been found to measure the walking distance in old cities from one resting spot to another. The most enjoyable cities are the ones that, that present the fewest barriers between people, uses, activities, and places. A recent investigation of permeability concludes that the most walkable grids are those that maximize the number of building lots one can reach within a given walking radius while minimizing the travel distance required to reach them. City block dimensions and building lot width matter. The rectangular Manhattan block accommodating many narrow lots and the small square Portland block present the greatest number of destinations to pedestrians in a 3,000 foot pedestrian shed. In fact, highly permeable, fine-grained, what we call fine-grained urbanism, having narrow lot sizes in shorter blocks contributes to the use of transit. At left, in, present, uh, in presenting choices of destinations, Adelaide blocks, blocks from the city of Adelaide, perform worst of these seven comparative blocks. Second best is the Portland block, that can be improved by reducing lot widths. The Manhattan block performs best, though it can be improved, at least mathematically, by shortening the block length. The tendency to aggregate lots for larger buildings impacts negatively the desirability of streets. 
And the aggregating of lots into all larger lots brings more valuable buildings that raise land values and taxes on those having older, smaller buildings. Smaller, locally owned businesses are likely to succumb to these market forces. And I say that under some um, concern because Phil Bass will have something to say about this. And uh, maybe we'll hear him tomorrow reflect on this comment I've just made. He might say I'm wrong. At right, in this proposal for Bath uh, in the UK, positioning the big box grocery store marked with a star into the middle of the block retains the fine-grained street front and short blocks of historic Bath. At left, see Bath in 1760, Walcott Street, and it's this street here. Ah, I'll just point to it here. In both, in both images, was, cut, was, was lined with shallow floor plate row houses with long gardens uh, tailing down to the riverside. At right, by 1885, these same lots are filled with dwellings. If Bath is like industrialized cities more generally, workers created a huge demand for low-cost housing in an unregulated market. The lots are filled with deep floor plate houses. Back gardens are filled with tiny houses having windows on one wall and facing narrow lanes, what the Brits call back-to-backs, infamous back-to-backs. Um, Gustavo Giovanni, an early 20th century Italian architect, little known among Anglophones, successfully returned historic urban fabric to sustainable modern use. The bottom image maps Giovanni's work in the Salicotto quarter of Siena in 1928. The hatched building perimeters are added buildings. The dotted lines denote removed buildings. He pared away, and that's actually the term he used, pruning is the term he used. He pared away encumbering additions in historic cities to make them both more visually appealing and more healthful. The satellite map shows the proximity to the campo and the seamlessness of his work. At right, see a street view of Giovanni's intelligent and sensitive compliments to the streets of Siena. Most of us don't even know it's new work, and we're happy. European artists joined in what appeared to be the, spir the spirit of their time, a campaign to free the city to a new form. For example, Bruno Taut, 1920, pictured it left here, or his image is pictured it left here, the dissolution of the town. He promoted the conceptual redefinition of the city as an amalgam of pod-like cells. In a landmark meeting of the International Congress of Modernist Architects and following the leadership of Le Corbusier, they accepted Walter Gropius's theory for linear multi-story buildings that would afford greater building up separations, have access to the sun, and produce more open land between these slab-like buildings. At center, at the top of this image, is the Heath Street Houses, 1941, and adjacent at bottom is Bromley Park, added 12 years later, and at right see a view of Bromley Park. The Heath Street Houses in Jamaica Plain, Boston, are th long, three to four story modernist styled residential buildings. They are oriented southwest to northeast to maximize morning and midday sun, and arranged on a super block with no intervening streets. Though this seemed a very rational concept to maximize solar access, this was disproved in an early use of computers in architectural research. And note how those who lived in these houses must be perceived as living in the projects, if only because the buildings on these pods bear no relationship to the, to the community in which they are set. Clarence Perry pro proposed the neighborhood unit in 1929, indicated in the orange box. This is cellu the cellular planning unit that was intended to focus a discrete population with common attributes on a neighborhood school and to keep through traffic to its perimeter. That still sounds good. It's now illegal because it's racial or became a, a tool for racial structuring. President Herbert Hoover's National Conference on Home Building and Home Ownership 1932 staked out the agenda for federal oversight of neighborhood development and urban renewal. These recommendations including the use of the neighborhood unit as a residential planning, planning model. What's more, for public housing projects in the 1930s, the federal government coupled the neighborhood unit with the superblock or pod. 
The first federal realization of the neighborhood unit may be the Public Works Administration low-income housing project, the Carl Mackley Houses, Philadelphia, 1933. The project has been described as a dangerous joining of Perry's neighborhood unit to Corbusier's ideal of the residential tower. At right, at right now, an overlaid, two cities uh, of, uh, two views of cities and carbon dioxide carbon dioxide generated by automobiles in the Chicago region per year. At left, the traditional view that cities produce large amounts of greenhouse gases. At right, the emerging view, city dwellers produce relatively low amounts of greenhouse gases. Sprawl can be de described as cellular or pod-like neighborhood units with traffic concentrated ar on arterials for detached single-family houses on quarter-acre lots and larger the energy use and emissions produced are sourced in the suburbs. And I hope you understand what I've done. I've taken the, the neighborhood unit of Clarence Perry's and I've replicated it ad infinitum to describe what I saw when I left Dallas to come here. Chris, is the red representing the same thing in both of those diagrams? <coughs> Chicago? Yes. 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 So I think the point is that uh, the high greenhouse gases are being produced in this, they're being sourced to, what they're doing is mapping the source of those who produce them. Okay? So, even if, uh, if they're spent in transit. <laughs> right. So. That, that's, is that set, no, that, that's just Cook County. That's not set. That's just Cook County. Well, you're right. It is just, uh, no, 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 Kane is here. My county is, Kane, uh, of Kane is here. Okay. So, Kane, you can't see this. Uh, it's McKen. It's, it's all seven. I can see it. It's yes, you can. Yeah. So, uh, we'll we're both from the Chicago area, so we know what we're talking about here. But it's, it's. Uh, I don't know the county above, but then there's McHenry and King Lane. and uh, and um, Will. and Will. Yeah. And uh, what's the top one? Uh, Lake. Lake. Uh, right, of course. So we can stop here actually, and and uh, if maybe you have, maybe Phil, you have a question here or a point you'd like to make, and others, and then we'll then we'll continue. Uh, <laughs> I said something about market, and I thought you might uh, uh, you might want to talk about taxing uh, property oh. instead of buildings. So, oh, oh, oh. so, uh, uh, <laughs> and maybe, maybe you'll I don't, maybe you're going to talk about that tomorrow. Yeah. What I'm really doing is encouraging you all to attend Phil's session tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Do you have other comments or questions? Yes, please. Well, I, I will refer you to the expert. Uh, I think Doug Farr, uh, who's written a number of books on this, uh, and in his most recent book, is embracing the present political reality that we may not have national leadership to move in the direction that we need to go, actually lays out um, a, pl a plan that communities could undertake their own strategies for meeting the needs, that, uh, the goals that need to be met. And he, and he remains hopeful even within the present reality that we, that we have. So uh, I would recommend uh, his book. It, uh, I think it's Sustainable, Sustainable Nation. Uh, I think. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, it, but 10 years, I think, is what the latest report says. The, uh, the UN related, uh, uh, endorsed report that just was broken two weeks ago says we have 10 years to make this change. So. so this is really interesting. It's totally outside my field of expertise and everything, but it's fascinating. Thank you. And I'm wondering, um, this idea of the density and, the, and so on, um, I've lived in communities where there are these developers who build these um, town center mixed mm -hmm. where there's supposed to be mm -hmm. multiple income level housing and, you know, goods and services so that people can live in walkable neighborhoods and kind of replicate the neighborhood like I grew up in New York. And they don't. 
People commute in and out of them, and it, it doesn't work at all. What are they doing wrong? What do they need to do to get it right? That's an excellent question. Um, and it has, uh, those, those people will call, uh, have a name. They're, they're new urbanists. And I think that's complicated. Um, it's complicated by the fact that in many places, building those kinds of places where we can live and work are illegal. And zoning ordinances have to be changed to actually permit the kinds of places where you can live and work in the same place. Until municipalities change those zoning ordinances, uh, where you can do that is limited. There are, there are excellent examples of where that is being done, and it's, it's lo a larger change than can be handled in a single instance. So it will take more. On the other hand, they're incredibly popular, and it appears to be that they're only limited by the, by, by the limited supply. And so, um, and people will tell you that they that they feel a greater sense of community living in places like that. So that would be more the topic of the next session where I talk about social sustainability. But they're not doing anything wrong, we just need to do more of it, and more of us need to, uh, maybe one of the failures is that there isn't enough high quality employment in those places. That was the thing I was thinking about, because they tend to be very expensive housing. Yes. And the people who live there can't, can't work there, and and afford the housing. And so there's still a lot of riding in and out of these communities for people working and shopping. And so that doesn't seem to me to be the issue of zoning so much as they're, they're not doing something right there about making the cost of housing match the potential for income. And that's partly, so that there's two things there. Partly it is the, 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 the demand has elevated the prices so much that only the wealthy have access to those places. And then secondly, it's a, a very difficult problem. How do you attract high quality employment uh, to the places where you want, where people are living? And uh, I, I imagine, and there's many other complications, but, um, but those are two that I can think of. It's 11, I think I need, to, should I, Andy? Should I'll I press on? And then can you save that question at the end? I'll talk a little faster and we'll save some time. We'll start with your question. Is that okay? <laughs> Thank you. So, so now I'd like to talk to uh, talk about um, uh, supporting our local economies. In our first session, we looked at the urbanism metric permeability. We focus here on a short list of qualities that, in shaping a neighborhood, afford the formation of community for mutual benefit. And those uh, metrics will be connectivity, variety, legibility, and the enclosure of a street. At right, see, um, well, at right uh, see lines of segregation in Pittsburgh. Mapping at one dot per person according to the census data for race, this race mapping demonstrates that high volume streets, limited access highways, railways, and other exclusive function infrastructures are barriers to social assimilation and in our terms here, barriers to connectivity. In this case, as similarly in many examples in this data visualization study, an interstate highway and multiple rail rights of way, uh, to say nothing of topography, are city-scaled race moats. At left, street axiality uh, uh, graphic visualization of central London, in this network of streets, the streets requiring the greatest number of turns to reach are those in green. The most connected street, the one requiring the fewest turns to reach from all streets in the network, is the one marked in red. Great Oxford Street is the busiest commercial street in Europe. To put this another way, a street crossed with the most junctions with other streets is the longest street. It has been very powerfully said that the unconnected city makes poor people poorer. At right, I've uh, rearranged the Monopoly board <laughs> to demonstrate that street arrangements from cul-de-sacs to connectors to arterials favor those few who, can, uh, who own the Broadway and Park Place properties. At this real estate, as this uh, real estate demand grows, these properties can be owned only by national chains. 
we know where to look for Starbucks. At left, see a lovely image that suggests Jane Jacobs' advocacy for short blocks in a lattice network of streets. In such an arrangement, there's the greater variety of the local tap tapas or bistro in the absence of an, ele of, el of an elevated land cost makes possible a neighborhood supporting a local enterprise in mutuality. A third urbanism uh, metric is variety. We will look at a particular aspect of variety, the variety in dwelling type as a means of achieving compact urbanism, but also for social inclusion. A plurality of housing types arising from a mix of building lot and block sizes can accommodate a variety of economic strata. At top right, uh, see three areas with tw th 30 dwelling units per acre. This study, verified many times in different ways, undermines one of the mental images that we carry. These three urban forms accommodate the same rather dense population. The one at right we associate with being more modern, and we might appreciate the clear separation of uses, tall building for living, parking lot, and green space. The middle image may be, on reflection, more attractive in that no one is isolated so remotely from the ground, and the block center is a shared park space. The image at left that we associate with urban ghettos, sadly, has the greatest access to private gardens, as each dwelling unit, or at least all flats in a house, have access to a garden. Whereas there are some in the tower and some in the stack flats who will never have east, west, or south sun, every row house at left has access to light from two directions. And at left, all dwellings permit direct engagement with the street for mutual security and for neighborliness. The image at right, we have come to realize, depicts a building that is occupied by the wealthy or by the poor. The buildings at right uh, can be mixed tenure and mixed use. At bottom, um, at bottom right, see uh, Boston's North End. Jane Jacobs in The Death and Life of Great American Cities, 1961, pointed the North End as having very high density and this being achieved with a variety of building types or buildings that in turn accommodate a variety of, of dwelling types. The variety of building types are the complex ecosystem providing shelter, if you will, for a range of individuals, families, and economic capacities. At left top, Boston North End Census Tract 301 and part of 304 that includes the current Prado Park and shows a variety of building shapes. Look at the chart at the left bottom. In the top row, see that this area in 1960 had 42 gross dwelling units per acre and a population of 168 people per acre. In the bottom row, oh, I've lost a page. Um, but in the bottom row, you can see that the dwelling units have, uh, per acre have, have uh, raised or, and, and the population has declined. And I think what that means is um, that it's gentrified. So fewer families right. are living in more apartments. And, but and the, the family size is the same. It's about two and a half. If, I'm, if you go back to the number, I think it's, I think it's, a prior, it's between two and two and a half people per dwelling unit. It's what, if I understand, yes. I understand that graphic. Right. Let's come back to yeah, that. That's fine. Uh, I'd love to see a detail from the investigative intervention being crafted by my uh, Judson graduate uh, studio for the Winston Green neighborhood at the west edge of Birmingham in the UK. In this view, one can see the building types or shapes are varied and suggest a mix of residential types from flats to row houses. At right, see that this mix of building shapes intends uh, a mix of dwelling tenures, ownership, renting, families, singles, greater and lesser incomes. This may look easy, but inclusive in neighborhoods are a challenge. At top, in an image I will discuss in more detail in our last session, illustrates at its left hand Aristotle's principle of distributed justice. 
to use uh, Timothy Gorringe's phrase, there's a common treasury's treasury, the goods of which are to be distributed justly, if not equally, then at least in some fair proportion. At bottom, see the planning study dated 1969 for the new town of Milton Keynes by the Milton Keynes Development Corporation from 1967 to 1992. Jane Hobson, in an older paper but still quite interesting, wrote New Towns, The Modernist Planning Project and Social Justice, and she, she focused the study on the new town, Milton Keynes. Hobson summarizes that the global north new town of the 19th century and 20th centuries was a project to repair the inequalities of in, in industrialized cities. Hobson concludes that the new town, a discredited enterprise by the end of the 20th century, is a modernist planning project that is not capable of meeting the principle of social justice. As Hobson writes, modernism seeks a utopian new future rationalized in scientific knowledge according to which modernist planners try to diffuse social benefits across all social groups by reducing urban equalities and creating more socially just urban areas where the good life could be shared by all. The utopic rationalized approach accounts for its description as a devolved and radical grid plan Formative in this was the modern theory of urban planner Melvin Weber, who believed that modern communication would eliminate the need for proximity. On the other hand, individual automobile transportation would allow our dispersal in privacy across a region. He idealized community without propinquity. Uh, propinquity. Excuse me. Hobson makes an introductory, con uh, introductory conclusion. By the post-1945 era, planning had been institutionalized as a tool of the interventionist state. Planning was implicitly assumed to be servicing, serving the needs of all groups because the state was considered representative and therefore working in the common good. Planning was a top-down endeavor because planners were considered to have a comprehensive perspective which allowed them to recognize the overall public interest. There was a belief that people could be changed by changing their environment. The central strategy for turning immigrants into middle-class stable citizenry therefore, was to provide them with a middle-class physical environment. The rationality applied to the modernist planning of Milton Keynes has not delivered distributive land justice or distributive justice and worse, stokes other injustices. At left is workplace population density in 2011. Red indicates high intensity of workplace population density. It's where the jobs are. At right, see top method of travel to work. Indicated is the top method of travel to, for everyone, aside from those in the town center, is car or van. At right top, see the extensive and comprehensive plan of the Redway Cycling Network. Hobson writes that, the distri that distributive justice quantifies conveniently material goods and social positions, but does not take into account social structures. The latter are categorized as exploitation, marginalization, powerlessness, cultural imperialism, and violence. First, Hobson sees an exploita exploitative social structure in the distance of high quality employment from residential areas. The Milton Keynes urban design arranged land uses so that low grade service jobs in commercial areas could be reached on foot or bike by mothers from homes where their primary care, where, where their primary role is child care. The urban design arranges then the exploitation of women whose employment qualifications might exceed the quality of the employment given that higher grade employment required better transit than, MK, than Milton Keynes provides. The data visualizations demonstrate the intended outcome. Cars determine access to employment. While the planning history of Milton Keynes states the intention not to separate neighborhoods by economic power, the neighborhood forms have indeed resulted over time in social separation. At top, see the index of multiple deprivation 2010. At right, the same index for 2015. See that there was little change in deprivation over these five years. At bottom, the detail of the 2015 index makes clearer that the pod-like or cellular planning is congruent with the outlines of economic success or deprivation. The relevancy of the recent detailed new national maps show how neighborhoods shape children for life becomes clear. I hope you're aware of this uh, recent uh, publication. The researchers believe much of this variation is driven by the neighborhoods themselves, not by differences in what people bring to them. 
The more years p children spend in a good neighborhood, the greater the benefits they receive. And what matters, the researchers find, is a hyper-local setting, the environment within about a half mile of a child's home. It may be that, in the case of Milton Keynes, the conceptualism of the cellular planning, forward-looking as it seemed in the late 1960s, may have realized in concrete form the, de the determination of life outcomes. This would be quite the reverse of its intention. Another observer states that the severely modernist Nether Nethersfield neighborhood, marked with a yellow star, built in 1973, quickly became one of the most deprived estates in, 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 in Britain. And you see it's still that in 2015. Social infrastructure, including mediating institutions, recall Jane Jacobs' observation that thriving neighborhood streets require stalwart institutions. Fred Kent of the Project for Public Spaces writes, to be successful, communities of all sizes need at least 10 destinations, places where people want to be and which can give an identity and image to their communities. At left, see the current Google satellite map of Grand Rapids, Michigan, and the same quarter mile pedestrian shed. Within this pedestrian shed, I've plotted the locations of independent grocery stores from a 1925 map of Grand Rapids, Michigan. The Google map shows the Cross City Highway explains the destruction of the neighborhood in the mutuality of grocery stores to this neighborhood. But look at the number of them. None of us live in neighborhoods like this these days. At right in the top circle, measuring the quarter mile pedestrian shed that is often used to scale a neighborhood. Diameter or, or radius? Uh, I mean that is radius. Um, and what I'm showing you here is that same pedestrian circle for the social infrastructure there is uh, around the Bishop Latimer Church of England and its house. The latter now occupied by Ash and Angie Barker, pioneering urban activist missionaries, has become not a private house but a social hub. In this map, grocery stores are marked in blue. See that Winston Green is a desert for food and for social infrastructure. Arkwright Town in the UK's Derbyshire uh, was relocated. In a study of this social experience, there is the conclusion, for mo foremost is the need for residents to have a say in the shaping of their surroundings. Uh, Marcus Menzel, the sociologist employed to mediate between the residents and the developers of the Hamburg Quarter, uh, Hafen City, writes, we are producing social and cultural environments for the next century. After all, a city is not only a commercial product, but also a public good. You can't have a totally structured place and then just expect people to fit in. But nor will it work if everything is totally open to interpretation. The goal is to find a balance between structures and freedoms and opportunities. At right, uh, see the academic proposal for the 4th Street Square in the larger Charlottesville downtown plan. The yellow star marks the site of Heather Heyer's death in the protest against the Unite the Right rally in August 2017. At left, from top left to bottom right, from the existing public housing plan, and I guess we can all recognize this, we understand what this is, even if we're not told that this is a public housing project. See an incremental, inclusive town building that is guided in later phases by community participation. So over time, the people that live in the social housing or public housing project are reaccommodated and then as it fills in incrementally and replaces those buildings, it becomes a town that's indistinguishable from Charlottesville generally. And, and, and it could be a place in which those people, those people, have a chance to participate in shaping what happens after them. In this and the next slide, we're seeing facets of another urbanism metric, enclosure and intervisibility. At left, a high visible street, 75% intervisibility. A street is constituted. I love this language. A street isn't really a street. <laughs> a street is only a street when it has at least 75% of the framing buildings having shallow direct access to the street. Most of us at dark don't walk down streets that, have, that lack intervisibility. We don't know what to call it, but that's the street we don't walk down. Most secure are buildings on streets with at least 75% intervisibility. Intervisible buildings have entrances and windows that are visible 
from the entrances and windows of buildings facing from across the street. There is the danger of people knowing too much, but we can deal with that as a special case. At right, Anno uh, Syros, a street in uh, Ermupoli in Greece. Engagement means building and living in places that do not isolate us horizontally, but afford solidarity. And what I mean by solidarity here is providing security for one another. It's one of the reasons we live in neighborhoods. Enclosure describes places having a desirable, perhaps secure feeling, room-like proportion. Two streets from Charleston at left, street enclosure demonstrating the ideal ratio of three to four. At right, see the street enclosure demonstrating the lowest degree of enclosure, one to two. Building type brings the quality of enclosure to securing a street in mutuality. Flats with lines of sight longer than about 50 feet to and from the street may be too far removed to influence the safety of the street below. Least effective for affecting uh, mutual security on a street would be residential types with flats higher than three stories above the street or with corridors with long connections to a central stair or with doors that do not engage the street directly. That is, if somebody's in a long corridor upstairs, four or five floors, they can't get down to help you, even if they wanted to. The final urbanism metric we will see is this in this session is legibility. Barcelona is legible or read by all with meaning. When there is conjunction of three factors, first there is the urban arrangement. In the street wall of the most connected street, uh, the Rambla, the urban arrangement is opened. This makes possible our exposure to an activity. We know the activity of a market. Finally, the building form is one that we associate congruently with this activity. City dwellers and visitors find the place navigable and comprehensible. That's what I mean by legibility. At top left, in 2010, the British uh, Commission for Architecture and the Built Environment published People and Places, Public Attitudes to Beauty. The British government surveyed public attitudes toward beauty in hopes that this would be an area in which a common social consciousness could be cultivated. In excerpts, the report states, not only are people ready to hear and to engage in a national debate on the subject, they call for beauty to be reinstated as a public value with meaning that stretches beyond the latest trends in fashion, hair, and even architecture. Across all age groups, older buildings were invariably favored as being more beautiful. In 2014, Wintonians, the residents of Winchester, took to the streets protesting a developer proposal for an area of the historic core, core called Silver Hill. There was collusion. The architectural character was lacking and the buildings were, and the drawings were found to be deceptive. One of the slogans was, Winchester deserves better. In the months following, the public advocacy, advocacy group, Res Publica, produced a working paper whose title sets this issue on new ground the community right to beauty. Our places do matter, and some meet us more effectively in our embodiment as individuals, groups, and communities. Over time in a place, we develop relationship to place that we individually and collectively describe as rootedness and even, even identity. And I'll stop again uh, for a couple minutes here, and we can take your comments or questions on on the social implication of urbanism. Any comments or questions? Yes, I'm Andy. Curious about the um, correlation, and this is perhaps a question for a sociologist, uh, which I'm not, but. The, and the, neither am I. <laughs> the, the correlation, or perhaps even causation, between suburban sprawl and declining trust in institutions generally. Yes. Um, and maybe how that, um, if that correlation or causation does exist, maybe how that sort of plays into some of the things. Robert Putnam, Bowling Alone, makes that, that point. He says that uh, in the early 1960s, a number of things happened concurrently. Um, we started watching TV and we started living in suburbs. And that, uh, that, the result of that was that we stopped joining the PTA, right? Uh, or, and, and joining bowling leagues. Uh, so he, he would say, I think one of the, um, 
one of the conclusions from the, the, the Putnam made is that when we live in suburbs, because the structure protects our investment, we are less prone to be engaged in politics. Uh, but when we live in cities, we are because we realize our protection and our, the, uh, our place depends on our participation. So there is, uh, the sociologists are saying that, there's, uh, that there are connections and there's many, many more. Some, some would say that, uh, that the social isolation of uh, suburbia uh, is causing social pathologies that might even be linked to some of our school massacres. And that's a terrifying prospect. But, yes? Question about, yes. Um, you mentioned, I, wouldn't, I want to make sure I follow the whole thing, but you, you mentioned this uh, neighborhood hub design that, that unfortunately led to racism. So what, what turned out to be or what seems to be the solution to that? Well, so Milton Keynes you know, was the, the, the finest example of sort of this rational planning of the 1960s. And, uh, and as the author says, Jane Hobson says, that it, it is found, at least in Britain now, to be a failed experiment. And so we don't do that anymore. Um, so the, the, the idea is to provide, is to provide uh, housing closer to jobs that allows for a mix of incomes uh, so that more people have more access uh, on foot or on bike, which is not a pipe dream. This is Copenhagen. <laughs> this is Stockholm, right? These are not things that can't be done. They are done. Uh, these are and, and some of the most thriving places on the planet. The key seems to be places for mixed Yes, yes. And, and it's true in my own town, uh, it was a regional scaled city, and as it lost its, uh, its regional shopping draw, it seems almost as if they tore everything down around the central core, so that there's no, there's no, there's no uh, housing for, for, for uh, there's no housing for multiple families. It goes directly from regionally scaled and underused city center and single-family houses. And so even still, the problem is not solved in Elgin because there's not enough people within walking distance to even support the now downsized city center we have. That's my analysis anyway. Yes, Phil. So, yeah. uh, not to jump any guns, uh, are you gonna talk about missing middle housing? No, no, and, and Phil's put the term on this. This is a, Well, I didn't put the term yes. on it. it, it but a, well, it's a term among new urbanists uh, that describes uh, a variety of housing types that exist between the single family detached house and apartment, you know, high, rise, high rises or mid rise apartment buildings. And so uh, it would include attached single family houses, it would include uh, ancillary dwelling and its coach houses for a single family house, it would include a two flat uh, or a three flat. Two of them together to make six flat. Put two together on a corner from a different way, you get 12 units on a corner. And then sometimes you have a mid block U shaped courtyard apartment that might have 30 units. Uh, in all, all in buildings of two to three stories. And, um, and so um, Chicago, um, Chicago's full of them. Most, most cities are full of them. But I mean, mm -hmm. Chicago has, is full of really good examples uh, of these. And they're not built anymore. So right. that's the phenomenon. Exactly. And it may have to do with banking, uh, how, how developers get money, and it's a complicated problem, but, but they're not being built, so. It, it, it banking and parking and, um, and, and land value. And, and developers probably losing the, the, the wisdom of how to do it. Right, yeah, yeah, it's a kind of unknown type. So this firm in California, has, has, uh, Opticos, has um, applied this term called missing middle housing, that, that it's, it used to be there, but it's missing. So they're they're promoting it, but I mean it's a it's a it's a very good idea, and uh, but but uh, the, the the culture has changed in such a way that we don't we don't make that kind of stuff. It we have to relearn how to do it as we learn a lot of other things. Should we go on? Okay. And you're saving your question. I keep. Yeah, no, that's okay. <laughs> I, it's still so I have to get a bit. Yeah, I'll bring it back up. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. 
So finally, um, uh, imaging here and ultimately the city of God, considering uh, Civitas as a sacred endowment. So uh, uh, I want to offer here some of the rich theological thinking and a swelling tide on the endowment that, uh, that we steward in our cities. My endeavor here as before is to focus on what may shape the appearance of good, true, and beautiful places. Murray Ray in Architecture and Theology, published just this past year by Baylor Press, observes that Christians have had two aims in our, in our inhabited places. First is from this example in Rome, we endeavor to redeem, redeem places from the mistakes of others in our own transgressions. In the top right image, see the cross placed there by John Paul II in 2000, dedicating the Colosseum to, to martyrs, and at top left, above the red dot, the position of this cross in the Colosseum. This wooden cross standing where the emperor would have, would have been accommodated attests, he says, to the need for penitence in the face of human brutality and to the hope that Christ's victory over violence and death will finally be completed. Following Ray, contemporary Rome, like Christian cities in history, also anticipate the heavenly Jerusalem. Bottom left and right document the Colosseum illuminated and signed, no justice without life. Since 2000, the Colosseum has been associated with the campaign against capital punishment. The night light turns gold on any day when a capital sen sentence has been commuted or when laws providing for capital punishment have been eliminated. The city of God, Augustine writes, will not forget the redemption of its people. The, this transformative eschatology allows that the fruits of human culture will be taken into the divine economy, there to be perfected and related to their true source. Ray goes on to say, goes, far, goes, goes so far to say, that this cultural fruit has been seen to include the classical style of architecture as this was bent to its proper end, that is, to the glory of God. And he says, and when the classical language of architecture, or any other architecture for that matter, is employed for the building of hospitals, orphanages, almshouses, and places of worship, as it was in medieval and Renaissance Europe, it begins to show forth, however imperfectly, an entirely different grandeur, the grandeur of the divine economy in which the lame are healed, the blind see, the poor have good news preached to them, and it left see a view of the still extant church and hospital of the Holy Spirit, uh, this view dated 1750 in the Vatican Bor Borgo in Rome. This is the New Jerusalem, one picture from the tapestry of the Apocalypse produced 1377 to 1382 for the French uh, king, or the French uh, Louis, the, uh, Louis I, Duke of Anjou. The Apostle John, exi exiled on Patmos, witnesses the New Jerusalem. Eric Jacobson in Sidewalks of the Kingdom writes that just as we understand the original and ongoing creation as, is an endowment, we can think of the built environment too as an endowment. First, he writes that the built environment can, like the created order, reflect the glory of God. Second, the built, built environment benefits us just as the garden benefited Adam and Eve with truth, goodness, and beauty. As we are humbled and grateful for the unmediated creation, we should be humbled and grateful for the fruits to us of the mediated creation, both in our land stewardship and in our stewarding of buildings and places. Finally, the built environment, like the created environment, is fragile. Both must be shepherded, and partly because they have importance, in ways that we cannot yet fully understand. Rather extraordinarily, Jacobson writes, we need to begin to look for ways that our cities can save us. The images, this image is a detail from Ambrogio's, uh, Lord, Ambrogio Lorenzetti's Allegory of Good Government, painted 1339. This painting and its complement warning the effects of poor government clothe the walls of the council room of the ruling nine in Siena's Palazzo Publico. At top left, we see justice benefiting from divine wisdom who offers both revelation and the scales of distributive and commutative justice. Distributive justice is the proportioning of the, of the, the common good to the individuals of the body politic, and commutative justice the proportionality between individuals. I've been thinking about the story of Zacchaeus recently. When, uh, when Jesus draws him down from the tree, he says, uh, I'll, I'll, um, I'll make good what I've done to individuals, and I'll give a portion of all that I have 
to everyone, right? It's an example of both commutative and distributive justice. From the scales come rope cords down to the figure of concord who twines them together. Along the bottom from left to right is meant to be the 24 elders of Revelation whom are separated by Sienna's, who are represented by Sienna's own counselors as they bear together in concord the rope to the right hand of the great figure at right, the common good. And I hope you're hearing my play of cord, concord, rope. The common good, surrounded by the three theological virtues and the four civic virtues, represents the telos for contemporary Siena in the New Jerusalem. Alberti, the Renaissance architectural theorist who wrote the first civic theory of architecture, recalls Augustine, who in the City of God, pres preserves from Cicero the tradition comparing a city's political concord and therefore its security to a musical harmony. Timothy Gorringe writes that this political concord was an Augustinian feature of medieval and Renaissance urban theorizing and as such a work of transformative eschatology. Gorringe, Gorringe writes that the Dominicans, very strong in Siena, also impacted theolog theologically the transformative eschatology of that city. He writes that Dominican theologians had learned from Aristotle that the good life is a good life in common. However, for the Sienese oligarchy, the common good did not mean by distributive justice, democratic equality, but it did mean inclusiveness. As separate but equal is not inclusive, so the Sienese recognized that inclusive social justice can be more important than distributive justice. First at bottom left, this picture illustrates the first extant and complete um, translations of Aristotle's ethics and politics into a modern language. In the top register is the personification of universal justice. The lower, lower register depicts particular justice in its two kinds. On the right hand is commutative or remedial justice. On the left, distributive justice includes three components, fairness, the mean, and proportionality. The virtuous mean in political ethical circumstances is analogized to the heavenly proportionality that was believed to be discoverable in the world. In God's economy, inequality was limited temporarily to the reset afforded by the Old Testament Jubilee. The tolerance of inequality may be limited by the ratio of one to 10. The common good depends on due proportion after which solidarity is lost to envy and resentment and eventually to revolution. At top left is Siena's hospital of Santa Maria della Scala that was both a hospital but also a hostel for travelers on on the uh, France to Rome highway. And at right, uh, the Grancia de Cuna, a fortified fa farm in the fertile Val d'Orcia farmland that furnished the food to maintain the community's inclusive hospitality in Siena. Each district of Siena had a magistrate salaried by the public whose job included the defense of the poor. Accordingly, the city provided cheap food and water so that all had access. In city planning, Gorringe writes that justice is a hallmark of grace, not from scratch, but from scrap. Little plans and lots of them, devolved and intergenerational decision-making uh, are, uh, are the manifestations of this grace. Also from Aquinas, beauty is a measure of grace perfecting nature that includes our world. Siena's Campo, a beautiful setting, was the second center of the city and the one where the meaning of the common good preached, uh, um, was preached in the cathedral, that was preached in the cathedral was worked out, one might say, in the beauty of the good and the true. So in the Campo, you could have no weapons. There was preaching. There were feasts. And it was in the Campo that the food was distributed in time of famine. By contrast, Gorringe laments the story of Exeter in the southwest of England. At top left, see the Exeter High Street before the war bombing. At bottom left is the proposed new street of Princess Shea, Exeter, circa 1946, with a view towards Exeter Cathedral. Even if the architecture is cheerless, this development maintained its everyman character. However, under pressure in the 1990s, the Exeter Council sold the central business district to a land developer. 
At center, a proposal view, and at bottom right, a street view showing unrented shops in the current development. Exeter is, Exeter is described now as a clone town of Britain that traded its working town center for cafe culture. It is a disproportionality that estranges the beauty of a common culture in an appeal for the profits of a glamorous consuming culture. See the 1983 edition of Debord's uh, Society of the Spectacle, published in 1967. The work of philosophy and Marxist critical theory intends to wake us from the thrall of capitalist commodification. The photograph of these moviegoers ima imaged the spellbinding ecstasy Debord wanted to see thrown over in a revolution enabling us to see reality, or the reality that Marxism conceptualizes, rather than the uh, fixated representations. The slide background is a detail from Giovanni Bellini's St. Francis in the Desert, circa 1480, to represent in St. Francis's sacramental love of the world, uh, J.K.A. Smith's reminder from Augustine, Augustinian theology, forgive me for mixing Francis and, uh, and Augustine, but from Augustine's uh, theology of anthropology, we move to what we love. Similar to Debor, Jamie Smith writes that we miss the truly important as our desires are met, but not fully and deeply satisfied in glamorous places accommodating liturgies of consumption. The Jesuit Michel de Certeau, mentored by theologian Henri de Lubac, was a scholar of early Ignatius and the spiritual exercises, and more broadly he was an important 20th century intellectual with a special interest in cities. Philip Sheldrake in Spiritual City argues that de Certeau's Ignatian spirituality is present in his work from early to late. Sheldrake sees de Certeau's fourth vow to travel anywhere for mission as underlaying de Certeau's important focus on a journey of everyday practice. He was suspicious of policymakers and planners. Accordingly, in the preface to the first volume of The Practice of Everyday Life, he advocates the notion of tactics for shaping city life in contrast to the totalizing strategies of the socially and politically powerful. Because of his deep foundation in the spiritual exercises, Deserteau saw wonder disclosing ordinary life as mystical, as a spiritual economy that is in itself spiritual practice. In The Practice of Everyday Life, Volume 2, his colleague, Pierre Mayol, expresses this directly the important Ignatian theme to contemplate place. At top left, see Swiss-French architect Le Corbusier's contemporary city of three million inhabitants, 1922. At bottom left is Grain Elevator from the volume one title page entitled Three Reminders for Architects in Le Corbusier's first manifesto for modernist architecture towards an architecture, 1923. And at top right is Le Corbusier's hand over the Plan Voisin model that was displayed in the Esprit Nouveau Pavilion built for the 1925 Paris International Exhibition of Modern Decorative and Industrial Arts. And finally, center, when the cathedrals were white, a voyage to the land of the timid, published in French 1937 after an invited visit to the, Met, to the Museum of Modern Art, New York City in 1935. De Certeau adopted the contrast of urbs, as he says, a mapped, planned, architecturally conceived concept city over against civitas as shaped by the urban narratives of a community of people. Using this urbs to civitas distinction, De Certeau's Ghosts in the City rejects two themes that are associated with Le Corbusier's design of the urbs, its planning and its architecture. A tendency to erase the past and a tendency to subordinate the realities of people's lives to abstract concepts of space. Sheldrake writes, Le Corbusier sought to create an ideal world through the perfection of design and planning. True knowledge were to be, to be, were to be found in the inner individual life. The outer public world of self-exposure, mixture, and engagement with strangers was of dubious worth. His city theory th sought to eliminate anything that reinforced public life as a determining factor in human identity. Not surprisingly, Le, Corbusier's, Le Corbusier disliked participatory politics. Authoritarian systems offered efficient bureaucracy. 
Le Corbusier's almost mystical emphasis on the radiant city with glass towers reaching to the sky appealed to a transcendent horizon where the city itself becomes the temple. Le Corbusier's city plans had no churches because he believed that all human desires could be met and realized in this utopian urban form. Disserto argued against the modernists for their reduction of transcendence to abstractions about space and light, but most of all because they overestimated the possibility of ultimate fulfillment engineered purely by design. Not the rational geometries, but rather the narrative of inherited memories and neighborhoods have the power to shape environments and to transform them. The Atlantic published in September an ideas essay by Aaron Kleinenberg, who is the author of Places, Palaces for the People, how social infrastructure can help fight inequality, polarization, and the decline of civic life. The Atlantic essay is subtitled, America's Social Infrastructure is Falling Apart and It's Hurting Democracy. Social infrastructure is disappearing. Also in the last few weeks, the New York Times published a new study revealing that the geographic limit of a neighborhood may be the most significant determinant in life outcome. And David Brooks wrote just last week that the neighborhood is the place for change. He references both of these studies and writes that place matters as much as ever and much more than we ever knew. More evidence of convergence comes in this article, also published in September, socially sustainable communities are more than friends and families and it summarized, weak ties are the strings that thread their way through the social fabric, allowing information, culture, and work to flow. Fragmented communities break down those ties. At the top left is a satellite view of the Campo of the Jesuits in the Canareggio neighborhood of Venice. At top right, the Campo and the Church in this painting by Canaletto. At bottom right, see a map of Venice marking in yellow the greater and lesser confraternities clubs, fraternities. A recent study documents approximately 900 confraternities, mostly Christian institutions, in Venice's history for a population that seemed to hover uh, historically at about 140,000 people. 900 median institutions in a population of 140,000 people. Maybe they didn't all coexist, but it's still a, a large, large number wiped away by Napoleon. Venice's Campo of the Jesuits is an example of the number and kind of mediating institutions or sites of social religious infrastructure. Situated around the Campo of the Jesuits were the confraternity of the tailors, the big barrel makers, the silk weavers, the tailors hospice, and charitable housing built by the greater confraternity of Santa Maria della Carita. Just in that inset and left. To Venice, uh, Charleston in 1844 compares favorably. Communicating the scale of Charleston uh, as this cluster of pedestrian sheds of quarter mile radius, see the number and distribution of faith-based institutions in purple, including churches, orphanages, and lecture rooms, public institutions in green, and civic organizations in yellow. My point is there's still quite a few. Look here at the number of pubs in the, in the district of central London in 1899. Gorringe observes that the pub in Britain has been an institution meeting a social need not required by those having wealth. We can look at this map very simply as a comparison of a, of a history rich in social infrastructure to our time anemic in such infrastructure. Gorringe sees social infrastructure and public places as sites in which all of the shared riches of a place are open to all its residences. Sites of grace, if you will, that anticipate the heavenly Jerusalem. This is the hillside town of Orvieto, north of Rome. In the top panoramic photo, one enters the city from the left, very near the head marked by Orvieto's oldest church, San Giovanale. Orvieto's spine, its north to south street, takes us along the the first tower to the second taller tower. Orvieto's four neighborhoods lay along this spine. The spine is crossed at its midpoint forming quadrants, a neighborhood to each quadrant. And this crossing is marked as if its heart with a clock tower. At the crossing, a right takes one to the cathedral 
and you see that in the bottom left photo. A left leads to the town hall, whose stair rising to its great hall is seen in the right-hand photo. Can you make that out? We're at the corner of a building here. We're looking through a plaza. The great hall is up here with its windows, but we're going to rise on this stair, which is important because uh, when I'm standing here, I'm, I'm looking back in the opposite direction. Now the bottom center photo. In Orvieto's history, one would have ex exited the, the deliberative assembly in the town hall and standing at the top of the ground stair, grand stair have been aligned to the path set before its citizens and see further against the horizon the cathedral. This street returns one to the meeting of the community's four neighborhoods monumentalized by the city's tower. Lifted for all is the clock whose keeping of time enabled Orvieto's residents to regulate their affairs in another kind of civic virtue. Walking the streets by myself and with others, mindful of ascending and descending, lifting my eyes to my navigating landmarks, I'm tracing the lines of the body politic and the matrix within which one accepts one's role in this particular community. My movement along these streets can be a liturgy of sacred and secular practice. Not that the city becomes itself the temple as a spectacle presenting itself in glamour is more real than real, rather a place in which one can be mindful that the liturgical work for the common good is a reality participating in the greater reality and where one's days are enriched by the deep soil of a thousand year history of anticipating the new Jerusalem. We might, in closing, then we might ask ourselves, how should we make neighborhoods, towns, and cities that we and others see as arcs? Arcs in which we have the company of others in a long endeavor to make a good place of urban shalom. For us, are these the places that are ultimately sustainable and perhaps are sustained into the very uh, uh, heavenly Jerusalem? Uh, thank you. Thank you. We have time for a few more questions. <laughs> You've waited all morning. Thank you. <laughs> Well, there's so much on this, but do you see that uh, I, I've been focusing on actually the, the, the physical things, uh, partly because I, I'm, I, my, my business is the education of architects, and so trying to, trying to look for those places where we can, we can make the argument that doing it one way instead of another way will actually be a condition that helps us build community. We don't want to go so far as to say that it's determinative, right? But we build, but probably what's more common at the present is that we build in ways that prevent community. And can, we can at least stop doing that, get out of our own way. So, but there's so much on this. Uh, I think that the presence of mediating institutions uh, or social infrastructure, that could be in any kind of building, but that is certainly uh, one of the uh, things that's being looked to 
as a means of, uh, so this book on private palaces suggests that we put more value on building public libraries as, as a social infrastructure or site uh, that, that we don't have enough of at present. So that, it, it does remind me of another, uh, another uh, thought though. Um, and maybe it's that silence comment. Um, as, as we walk, we all walk through airports and airports now believe th there is a right to engage us, to sell us stuff, right? And the only way you can escape it is by being a club member, right? And getting out of it. So you have to buy silence, right? And so um, I'm putting that together with some other things uh, um, uh, being written about silence and, what, and how when we have silence, I'm taking the other side of silence here, but maybe places that look important, where, where what's, what we truly value is obvious to us, maybe that's kind of like a visual silence where we can actually meditate on things that we, that we truly value instead of being distracted as our attention has been commodified. Um, it is kind of interesting that in, in the township you can negotiate, you, you, you know that you are in company because you can hear even while you're sleeping that there are people present. It's probably a, it's a, it's a, that's a very, very old survival strategy. Yes. Sociologists could do more with that. I'm not a sociologist. <laughs> Other comments or questions or concerns? Yes. Um, so certainly in America, um, everyone, or a lot of people hate dependency. And yes. it seems like with a lot of what you're saying, might be better off pushing towards interdependency with each other and certainly in some of these cases on the government to for the local government to uh, orchestrate all this planning yes um, and would you say that we should rely on the government to that extent um, and I feel that if the government has put in planning measures to maybe create like those race moats, as you mentioned, uh, it would be a good idea for the government to go back on that and make the changes necessary to retract it. But in a lot of cases, those seem accidental moats. Um, in Pittsburgh, for example, I'm from near there. Mm. Um, it's a very old city, and it's built on like, big hills, yes. very steep places. So I think a lot of the moats there are accidental. Are topographic, right. And I just wonder, what are the practical measures? Who do we give power to? Um, I think you've said something that's true about Americans. We, and that's that is a our our independence is one that we've we've won through wealth. And it just occurred to me as you were saying this that we tend to focus on uh, I don't choose to be dependent on others, right? But there's the other way of looking at it is, uh, should I, as a person of faith, put myself in a neighborhood where others who need can depend on me? So I have an elderly neighbor. Some would say in my neighborhood that she's excessively nosy. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I say, Gene, look at all you want. Watch us all you want. We, we depend on you, Gene, right, to help us all stay safe. She's got the quickest number for the, for the police. Um, but we all, she's an elderly woman, and there's going to be a point at which she's going to need a neighbor to call, right, to, uh, to rescue her. And so we could look at it two ways. You know, we, yes, we do value our, our independence, and we, we, we preserve that through our wealth. But is there, uh, perhaps this is another Christian way of looking at this, that we allow ourselves to be in places where others can de depend on us? And we might need it eventually, too. Yeah. We officially are out of time, although I suspect there might be additional conversations uh, that you can continue to have uh, in the moments that follow. Uh, join me once again in thanking Christopher. Thank you, Thank you very much.